In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for the Bible study tonight. Thank you for bringing us together for a good purpose. I will pray that your plan, your purpose of inviting us and bringing us together for the Bible study tonight will be realized in Jesus' name. Impact your power, your word, your life, your spirit upon every one of us in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, that you reach our souls, and reach our hearts, and reach our lives, and reach everyone and the family of everyone by your word tonight in Jesus' name. Be glorified in every life. And let the word have a definite impact upon every one of our lives in Jesus' name. That will not go back as we came. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. We're coming to the third epistle of John. And we're reading from verse 1. It has only one chapter. It says, The elder unto the well beloved girls, whom I love in the truth. Already you can see that here, John the beloved, being an old man an aged man, an aged apostle. And I told you the other time that this apostle was the last to die of the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. All the others had died. And now he still remained. He was in his 90s because he had been following the Lord from a very young age, from about the age of 25. And now he's about 95, 96. And he's writing to the church. He's been following the Lord for about 70 years. And then you can think about everything he had passed through. And all the churches he had touched and transformed by the truth of the word of God. And he's referred to as the apostle of love. And this apostle of love is now writing to the church. And he's written a general epistle. That's the first epistle. And then he wrote the second one to a mother of her children and a mother that raised up children in the Christian way. is writing this now to a man. And the name of the man you find in verse 1 is Gaius. And he called him the well-beloved. And he says, I love him in the truth. And then he comes to verse 2 and he says, Beloved, I wish above all things, other versions say, I pray above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth here he puts in a just uh, one sentence and in one verse about the soul and about the body and about the work of our hand it says i'm praying it says i desire it says i wish that you will prosper and that you will be in health you'll have the benefit of what jesus gave and what he did on the cross of calvary it's not only that he saved our souls he healed our body and he wants to keep us healthy and that our souls too will prosper he comes to verse 3 and he says, For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. Some people had gone to Gaius and they had been to the church that she attended. And these people testified about Gaius, obviously one of the leaders in the church. That's why this short epistle, short letter was written to him so that he'll be able to share that with other members of the church. And the day Sir John was a very much excited and joyful and happy about the very fact that they testified about Gaius, also an elder, also an old person, that he was walking in the truth. And then he said, that is John said in verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. What a joy to that old pastor. And what a joy to any leader when you've taught the truth of salvation. And the people accept that. And the people receive that and believe that. And then they become saved. And they are walking in the doctrine, the teaching, the truth of the word of God. A life that is saved. A life that is separated. A life that is influenced and infiltrated by the word of God. A life that shows that they are very different and distinct 
from all the people around them because of the impact of the gospel because of the power of the gospel today we're talking about experiencing the benefits of revealed truth experiencing the benefits of revealed truth number one it is truth truth the truth of the gospel and the truth of the scripture and the truth of the doctrine of the word of god the truth of salvation the truth of holiness the truth of righteousness the truth about heaven and the truth about our conduct our character our life the truth about christ the truth that comes to our lives and then turns us around and we're not the way we were before and it is not just truth it is revealed truth it's revealed unto us from the Spirit of God. It is revealed unto us in the Word of God. It is revealed unto us by the Spirit of the Lord. It is revealed unto us by the Scriptures. And then our hearts receive the revealed truth. We go on our knees and we pray. And we pray that those benefits of the truth we are receiving, those blessings of the truth we are receiving, will be translated into our lives, will come into our lives. And then by experience, we say, I have the experience i am saved praise the lord I have the experience i'm sanctified sanctify them through thy truth thy word is truth praise the lord i'm filled with the holy ghost because it says shall receive power after the holy ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in jerusalem and in judea and then in samaria to the uttermost part of the earth and that truth of the baptism in the holy ghost we have received and it is not just that we hear not just that we learn not just we write on paper but it comes to our heart and then the outpouring of the holy ghost is effective and real in our lives and they will say praise the lord i experienced the gifts of the spirit because of the word we're hearing that word is working mightily in us that word is working effectually in us and then now people can hear and people can see and those who have been responsible in teaching us that word of god is say we rejoice greatly because the word of god is working effectively effectually and powerfully and mightily in our hearts and in our lives and now we're walking in the truth experiencing the benefits of revealed truth there are three things we're going to consider as we look at those four verses of scripture number one pastoral portraits of the well beloved in the truth pastoral portraits of the well beloved in the truth number one pastoral portraits of the well beloved in the truth point number two perpetual promises for worshipers in truth point number three personal perseverance and walking in the truth personal perseverance and walking in the truth we'll come to number one number one what's your number one there pastoral portraits of the well beloved in the truth oh, what we want to find out here is look at verse one it says in verse one the elder unto the well beloved gills whom i love in the truth unto the well beloved gills what did he call him the well beloved who can we refer to as the well beloved actually that word well beloved was used concerning the lord jesus christ and so the word well beloved was used for the lord jesus christ by the heavenly father and jesus christ himself also he gave that word concerning himself the well beloved of the father what was it in the life of christ that made him to be the well beloved you remember his baptism in matthew chapter 3 as he was coming out of the water you'll know what the father said about him look at this he tells us in matthew chapter 3 reading from verse 16 and jesus when he was baptized went up straightway out of the water and lo the heavens were open unto him and he saw the spirit of god descending like a dove and lightning upon him and lo a voice from heaven saying this is my tell me 
beloved son you see that word beloved in whom i am tell me the next word well please you join those two things together beloved well please beloved son i'm well pleased in him and so bring that together up the well beloved and so Jesus Christ was referred to as the well beloved. And he, he pleased the Father. He pleased the Father in everything. In the works he did, he pleased the Father. In the words he spoke, he pleased the Father. In the life he lived, he pleased the Father. In obedience to the word of God already revealed in the word, he pleased the Father. In his interactions, everything he did, he pleased the Father. And every step of the way, every day of his life, he lived for only one thing, for only one goal, for only one purpose. He pleased the Father. And the Father said from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. What do we learn then? When somebody is referred to as a well beloved, it means uh, that person is following after the Lord Jesus Christ. He's been converted by Christ. He's committed to Christ. He's consecrated unto Christ. He continues with Christ. And is so committed to Christ that the word of Christ alone has impact in his life. And it's like he's following after the copy and after the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ is the well-beloved, look at this man, Gales. is following after the Lord after his conversion. And so he says to my well-beloved, Gales. And the same thing I can say about you if you are born again it's the same thing you can say about you if you are converted the same thing you can say about you if you are committed to the Lord consecrated to the Lord you are separated from the world you are separated unto the Lord and you are fully committed and surrendered submissive unto the Lord you live by the word of God that's what it means the well beloved in Christ to be a beloved means number one there is sonship there is sonship because uh, Jesus Christ being the son of the father that's why I was called the beloved number two there is a uh, being teachable teachable Jesus said as my father taught me he wasn't above the teaching of the father the teaching of the heavenly father he said all the things I do all the things I say all the places I go all the interactions I have and all the things I perform I do them as my my father has taught me if you're going to be a well beloved you'll be teachable you'll be teachable you submit to teaching your life will be influenced by teaching and your life will be controlled by teaching number one is sonship number two is being teachable number three trustworthiness trustworthiness he was trustworthy the father trusted him all that have given him he will do all that have commanded him he will do all the places i send him he will go even to go to the cross of calvary even though it was painful even though it was to be a great sacrifice yet he said yes i will do it you see when we are trustworthy like that and the heavenly father can trust us that the work i give him he'll do it faithfully it's not going to do part and live half it's not going to do half my way and do half his own way if we're trustworthy like that that's what it means when it says that we're well beloved it means we're faithful it means we're faithful the, jesus christ was faithful to the father and hebrews chapter 3 tells us that he was faithful in all things and he is even called the faithful and the true that's the revelation and because of that faithfulness the father looked at him and was well pleased the father looked at him and was satisfied the father looked at his life can we look at your life can the father look at your life everything you do in the secret everything you do in the public everything you do when people are there everything you do when people are not there and the father will say that's a son that's a daughter the father will say he's teachable she's teachable the father will say he's trustworthy she's trustworthy the father will say he is faithful she is faithful the lord jesus was obedient to the father even obedient to the point of death is there any limit to your own obedience or do you obey to a point <laughs> i think it is going to be tough now 
I think the persecution is going to come, the heat might come, the dangers might come. I see, can need to modify my obedience. Now, not Jesus Christ, he was faithful and obedient even unto death, unto the death of the cross. That's the, why the Father called him the well beloved. And the Lord is giving us the same challenge. He's saying, You can be a well beloved to you, living one day at a time, facing one problem at a time, solving one problem at a time facing one challenge at a time that the grace of God comes to your life and then you find out what the Lord had said. My grace is sufficient for you. And you take hold of that grace and you obedient to the Lord every time, everywhere. So you become obedient and you are well pleasing unto the Lord. And then there's nothing that, you know, Jesus did and then the Father said, couldn't he have done it another way to make me happy? Couldn't he have done it a better way to make me happy? Nothing like that at all. Everything Jesus did, he did in such a way that the Father said, there's no better way to do it. That's the way to do it. And the Father said, there's no other way to do it. That's the way to do it. I'm well pleased with him. That's what the Lord is expecting from you, from me. He's saying that if we're going to refer to as a well-beloved, we're well have the faith that we are sons of God, daughters of God. We'll have the attitude we're teachable and we will have the disposition we're trustworthy and we will have the attributes that we're faithful and we'll have the character that we're obedient and then we'll have the satisfaction that we're well pleasing unto the Lord. Look at uh, Romans chapter 16. In Romans chapter 16, I'm reading here from verse 3. Romans chapter 16, we're looking at it from verse 3. Here Paul the apostle was writing to the Roman church and then he was telling them about a family, about Aquila and Priscilla and see what he said about them. I'm reading from verse 3. It says um, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus. Not all those words because well, when the apostles call somebody well beloved and there's a reason why they said that they didn't use that word, they didn't just throw the word and not well beloved for that, well beloved for that. There were characteristics they saw, there was a conduct they saw, there was the life they saw, and there was a commitment they saw. In that verse 3, it says, I Greet Priscilla and Aquila, and he called them my helpers in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 4 Who for my life laid down their own necks. Verse 4, who for my life laid down their own necks, even, he says, unto whom? Not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. You notice that uh, Paul the Apostle is saying, look at Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla is the wife, I was the wife, and Aquila was the husband. It says, you know what he did? They were ready. They laid down their very lives for my sake. And then he said, I'm not only the one that noticed that, I wasn't the only one that noticed their commitment and their consecration, but you know, all the churches, the members of the churches, they could see the commitment of Aquila and the commitment of Priscilla. And he said, they were ready to live now surrender their lives so that they will help in the preaching of the gospel. They'll help in the propagation of the gospel. They'll help in the spread of the gospel. Look at verse 5. Likewise greet the church that is in their house. Salute my, tell me the next word, my well beloved Epanios. And then it says who is the first fruit of a Kaya unto Christ. First fruit, what does that mean? We've gone to the field and then we're reaping the field and this person came to know the Lord. He knew the Lord in such a dynamic way. We knew that this is one of the fruits coming out of our evangelistic outreach and he really came to the Lord. He was converted and then he was with this and with these people Priscilla and Aquila. You remember in Acts of the Apostles chapter 18. 
As of the apostles chapter 18, I'm reading here from verse 24. Acts of the apostles chapter 18, we're looking at verse 24. It says, and a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit, not sluggish in spirit, being fervent in the spirit, not lukewarm in the spirit, and being fervent in spirit, not cold in the spirit, and being fervent in the spirit, not lethargic in the spirit, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. Look at verse 26, and he began to speak boldly in the synagogue whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard they took him Aquila and Priscilla took this man Apollos unto them and expounded unto him the way of God tell me the rest more perfect those people they have the perfect knowledge of the word of god you know when we say well beloved it's not every day can hurry it's not every church go on. it's not everyone that says i'm a christian i'm born again i'm, I'm this and that the people that know the word they live by the word and look at apollos the one that was able to teach the word of god firmly and fervently and yet they knew they knew that something was still missing and so aquila and priscilla took this man and he taught him more perfectly look at verse 27 and when he was disposed to pass into a care the brethren wrote exhorting the disciples to receive him who when he was come helped them much which had believed through grace for he mightily convinced the jews and that publicly showing by the scriptures that jesus was christ well you understand what we're talking about that when somebody is called well beloved as we look at priscilla and aquila number one those are converted people converted people the people who have been converted to christ and it's not christ and idol christ and christ alone it's not christ and religion christ and christ alone and these people were totally committed unto the lord that's what they were called the well beloved they were converted they were committed they were sanctified sanctified and uh, can you see if you notice what we were seeing over there in uh, the epistle to the romans it says priscilla and aquila in the uh, acts of the apostles it says aquila and priscilla and aquila did not mind how could you name my wife before me how could you say priscilla falls hey i'm the head here and therefore you must always mention my name these people were sanctified there was no anger there was no bitterness there was no kind of opposition there's no conflict there's no fighting and when you say priscilla and aquila that's all right you say aquila and priscilla that's all right if you see the people we call the well beloved they're the people that are all around they are converted they are committed they, they, they are consecrated unto the lord and totally changed and transformed and thank God, which you can become well beloved. When your life reflects and when your life shows in all areas, but by the grace of God, that Adamic nature has been dealt with, and all there's sanctification. And these were well taught people, you can tell. Because when they saw Apollos, that he taught the word of God, they knew something was missing because he knew only to the baptism of John. And Aquila and Priscilla, husband and wife, they took this man and they taught him the word of God. And then the Apollos did not say, hey, Aquila, talk to me yourself. What are you bringing um, you know, uh, Priscilla for? That's a woman. I don't want to show my ignorance or my, you know, kind of income before a woman we're talking about sanctification the people that are really sanctified and they're not arguing about this or arguing about that and he was preaching fervently already and then they called him he didn't say what are you going to tell me i don't know i was trained on that john the baptist you know the courage of john the baptist that's where i came from what are you going to tell me submissive people 
teachable people, faithful people, well-taught people. Those are the well-beloved. And those are people that were steadfast in the faith, steadfast in the faith, knowing the Lord and following the Lord and nothing between them, no wall of demarcation between them and the Lord. And these were people that were discerning discerning you see aquila and priscilla priscilla and aquila you see how they discerned they discerned this apollos it was fervent the fervency did not uh, kind of deceive them and it was speaking forcefully the forceful speaking did not deceive them he was speaking from his heart he was a sincere man all that did not deceive them they discerned he didn't know enough and we know what to teach him so that we can bring him to perfect knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, the well beloved disciples of Christ, the well beloved followers of Christ, at those who are converted, at those who are committed, at those who are sanctified, at those who are well taught, at those who are steadfast in the faith, and they're the people that are discerning, that the people that have ability to teach. For you to teach Apollos, you must really have ability because that man already look at the way he was preaching, laying line upon line, precept upon upon precept and speaking forcefully directly and convincingly and yet they brought him around and they taught him more perfectly they had the ability to teach that's why they were called the well beloved and that's what the lord is wanting to do today he doesn't want you to be just a casual christian just a church going christian just a so so christian he wants you to be deep enough and he wants you to be loving enough he wants you to be so groomed and so taught and so schooled that you know the word of god from cover to cover and your life shows that and your life reflects that and then we can refer to you as the well beloved in christ you are getting there Amen. i said you will get there let's come back now to third john that's the third epistle of john and we're looking at verses one and china it says the elder unto the well beloved girls whom i love in the truth uh, john is always he is always emphasizing the truth he says whom i love whom i love he doesn't just say i love you i like you i appreciate you i have affection for you always joins the truth because you know if john john the beloved his heart was of the truth his blood system of the truth, his mind of the truth, his thought, his thinking of the truth, and anything he does and any relationship he maintains is based on the truth. That's why he says, Oh, my love in the truth. Then he goes on in verse 2, he says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper that's number one and be in health that's number two even as thy soul prospereth that's number three we're looking at point number two now perpetual promises for worshipers in truth perpetual promises for worshipers in truth first of all he says i wish above all things above all things do you have priorities in your life if you're going to do something can you say above all other things i'm going to do this if you are maintaining a relationship can you say above all other things that's what i'm looking for if you are raising disciples can you say above all other things this is what i want to develop in the disciple and if you're maintaining any kind of a goal or any kind of priority can you say this is number one in your christian life are there are things that you can say this year above all things i must get this done have you ever thought like that have you ever planned like that can you say your personal life i want this i want to be this i want to be that i want to be that. but above all things you see that's very important the people that just say you know join everything together they just lump everything together there's no priority there's no number one in their lives and there's nothing that they say yes i'm going to do this and this but above everything i'm going to push this aside i'm going to make this number one above all things i'm looking at ephesians chapter 6 ephesians 
chapter 6 and i'm reading here from verse 16 ephesians chapter 6 and we're looking at verse 16 it says in verse 16 uh, tell me the first two words there uh, have, have you not opened the bible ephesians chapter 6 verse 16 where are you now tell me out loud above all you see paul the apostle to your priorities he said yes many things are important yes many things are, are needful necessary but above all taking the shield of faith wherewith he shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked he says there's something that is more important than the rest and he says above all above all taking the shield of faith wherewith he shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one in your life you should be able to say above all other things above every other thing the thing that you must spend time on the thing you must consecrate for the things you must pray for and the things you must desire and the things you will not allow any friend you'll not allow any acquaintance you'll not allow any relative you'll not allow anybody on the face of the earth to touch you see that one must happen that thing i must get that above all things here john was writing to girls the well beloved he said well beloved you know what I wish many things for you. I desire many things for you. I plan many things for you. I pray for many things for but above all things. And here are three things that come on the list of above all things. Above all things I pray for. Above all things I desire. Above all things I pursue. It says in verse 2, number 1, that thou mayest prosper. I wish that for you. I decide that for you. Yeah. It will happen in Jesus' name. And hey, look at that. We're looking at that now. That thou mayest prosper. How does that happen? Matthew chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 32. Matthew chapter 6. And we're reading from verse 32. In Matthew chapter 6 verse 32. Here is what it says. Verse 32. It says, For all these six do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Look at verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's the promise of the Lord. It says, if you will seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, it says all these things shall be added unto you. That means you will prosper. I'm looking at prospered people here today. And he wants to freely give us all things, all need, all things that are needful in our lives. In Second Peter chapter one. Second Peter chapter one, I'm reading from verse three. According as his divine power has given unto us, tell me, all things, all things, all things that pertain unto life. Your life will not be empty. Your life will not be poor. Because he wants us to prosper. According to his divine power, he has given unto us all things that pertain unto life. And then it says, and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. That by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that's in the world through life laws you escape that corruption and you are com converted you are born again you are now committed to the lord i pray above all things that thou mayest prosper <laughs> number two it says that thou mayest be in health and be in health he wants us to be healthy what's the profit and what's the benefit if we prosper physically naturally and we prosper in a kind of way financially all right we're wealthy but then we're not healthy we don't have the health the lord will balance up everything in our lives your business will prosper the work of your hand will prosper and then he says that you be in health he wants us to be healthy you know when jesus was here on earth he healed the sick do you know that he delivered the oppressed do you know that has he changed i said has he changed he said today he will heal your body we're looking at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Hebrews 
chapter 13 verse 8 this is where we have the confidence that what john the beloved desired and what he planned and what he purposed and what he prayed for that will be in health it will be fulfilled in your life any sickness trying to damage your life and trying to slow you down and trying not to make you do the work that you need to do and the purpose why you are created to be here on earth all those sicknesses christ will take them away in hebrews chapter 13 verse 8 jesus christ the same yesterday today and forever he did it before he will do it again acts of the apostles chapter 10 acts of the apostles chapter 10 what he did in relation to any sickness upon the lives of the people that came to him um, acts of the apostles chapter 10 verse 38 how god anointed jesus of nazareth with the holy ghost and with power who went about and he has not changed who went about and is going about today and who went about is getting to you tonight who went about doing good and tell me the rest there healing all that were oppressed of the devil for god was with him first peter chapter 2 verse 24 first peter chapter 2 verse 24 who his own cell bear our sin in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you are healed by whose stripes i am healed by whose stripes i am healed you'll be in health in jesus name number one that thou mayest prosper you'll prosper number two that thou mayest be in health you'll be in health and then number three now it says even as thy soul prospereth even as thy soul prospered. Many people do not understand that the prosperity of the soul is the spirituality of the soul. The prosperity of the soul is the conversion of the soul. The prosperity of the soul is the protection of the soul. The prosperity of the soul is the life, the spiritual life, eternal life, abundant life on the soul. See what the Bible is saying about the soul and what can happen and what ought to happen i'm reading from psalm 19 psalm 19 verse 7 it says in psalm 19 verse 7 the law of the lord is perfect converting the soul that's why the prosperity of the soul begins when somebody comes to the lord and he turns away from sin and he believes on the lord jesus christ and the soul is changed is transformed is converted the word of god has come in and the word of god turns the life around and it says the law of the lord is perfect converting the soul and then he does something all the restlessness is gone because in matthew chapter 11 matthew chapter 11 i'm reading here from verse 29 take my yoke upon you and then it says learn of me for i am meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest tell me unto your souls rest unto your souls when the restlessness is gone when the lack of peace is gone when the confusion in the mind is gone and when the fear of judgment and the fear of hell when that is gone and there is rest in your soul there's peace of mind we have peace with god and we have peace in our heart we have rest in our heart we are restored unto fellowship with the lord number one there is conversion number two there is rest and then it says when that happens it says we have a soul that is prospering hebrews i'm reading from chapter 10 and i'm reading from verse 38 hebrews chapter 10 we're reading from verse 38 talking about the soul it says now the just shall live by faith um, and if any man draw back my soul shall have no pleasure in him but we're not of them who draw back unto perdition but of them that believe to the saving of the soul that believe to the saving of the soul converted already and then resting with the lord and now he continues and continues he doesn't backslide 
He doesn't go back. He's pursuing that life in the great beyond. And he says, we're not of them that draw back. We're of them that pursue and continue to the saving of the soul. James chapter 1. We're reading from verse 21. In verse 21 it says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. And receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. We're receiving the word, receiving the word. We're becoming steady in our faith, solid in our faith, steadfast in our faith, and we're pursuing unto the final salvation, the saving of the soul. In First Peter chapter one, First Peter chapter one, reading from verse twenty-two, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. Seeing ye have purified, purified, sanctified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. You see the soul that is prospering, that soul is converted. That soul is committed to the Lord and that soul is continuing with the Lord and that soul is so cleansed and purified and purged and perfect, perfected by the blood of the Lamb. First Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5, we're looking at verse 22 through to verse 24. First Thessalonians chapter 5. And here we're looking at a verse 20 from verse 22. It says, Abstain from all appearance of evil. And then it says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Listen to this. And I pray God, your whole spirit, and tell me, and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. When personally, purposefully, in a determined way, you avoid every appearance of evil. And then you have this fresh relationship with the Lord every time. And there's peace in your heart. There's purity of your life too. And then he sanctifies and purifies you. Spirit, soul, and body. Then it says, faithful is he. Who has called you? Tell me. Who also will do it? Tonight is your night. He will do it for you in Jesus' name. Because you see, that's how our soul will prosper. When we're saved, we're sanctified, we're filled with the Spirit of God, and we're saturated with the Word of God. Then the prayer of John the Beloved is answered on your behalf. And it says, I wish. I desire, I pray above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. We'll come to point number three now, personal perseverance and walking in the truth. Personal perseverance and walking in the truth. It says in verse three, for I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth, I rejoice greatly. All the people that came from there, they were testifying about you that thou walkest in the truth. I'm asking myself, and you should be asking yourself, how do you see a man? I'll say, that man is walking in the truth. How do you see a woman and then you tell yourself that woman is walking in the truth? What did they see? That they all had uniform testimony that they were walking in the truth. I'm sure you understand. We're not talking about physical walking that are moving one step after the other and I'm just going. Even the unbelievers outside, they are also walking and they don't stumble and they're looking at, you know, the place they're walking and they're walking straight. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about something spiritual. But it's something so spiritual that it's still practical 
empirical. It's something spiritual that is empirical, that is experimental, that is experienced. You can see it. The man has got something. You will get it. And then people can look at your life and say, praise the Lord. That person is walking in the truth. Number one, is walking with God. Walking with God. Because God is the God of truth. And if this man is walking in the truth, and God is the God of truth, is walking with God. And two cannot walk together except they be agreed. This man is always in agreement with God. God says, this is it. He says, yes, I agree. This how to walk. Yes, I agree. This how to live. Yes, I agree. This how to marry. Yes, I agree. This how to perform. Yes, I agree. The man is always in agreement with God. You know what? He's walking in the truth. You know, he's walking like Christ. Walking in the truth is walking like Christ. Because Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Jesus is the personification of the truth. And then, this is the man that is saying, if Christ were here, how will Christ speak? How will Christ dress? How will Christ talk? How will Christ preach? How will Christ pray? How will Christ be transparent? How will Christ do this? And this man is always walking like Christ. And Christ is the truth. This man is walking in the truth. You see, this man we're talking about is walking in the spirit and not in the flesh. Why did we say that? Jesus said, I'll send you another comforter. The spirit of, tell me, the spirit of truth and this man walking in the spirit not walking in the flesh that's a person walking in the truth when you are not fleshly when you are not sensual when you are not defiling and you are not defiled and your life is a life in the spirit and you are spiritual and you are not carnal and you are not walking like men you are not walking with the philosophy and the practices and the parables of men and you walk in the truth of the spirit that's walking in the truth you walk as the father has laid it down are you in agreement with the father and you walk like jesus christ will be walking if christ were here today and you're walking in the truth of the spirit and not in the flesh you are walking in righteousness. That's it. If you walk in righteousness, that your words are righteous, your actions are righteous, your behavior righteous, everything you do righteous, that's what we're talking about. You're walking in the truth. You walk in love. Because love produces a, tr a truth produces love if the truth of christ is in you god is love and the truth in god will lead you to the love of the truth and the love of the lord and because of that you are walking in, uh, in the truth not only that you walk in the light you walk in the light and jesus said he that believeth in me will not walk in darkness but will walk in the light there's nothing shady there's nothing colored. There's nothing hypocritical. There is nothing in pretense. Everything is transparent. You walk in the light and then you're walking in the narrow way. You see that? You're walking in the narrow way. Jesus said there's a broad way that leads to perdition. The broad way that leads to hell. But now you have decided, I've seen the narrow way. I've chosen that narrow way. I'm walking in the way of the Lord. That's the way, that's the thing that leads us to walking in the light. You see, this is very important because many people don't understand. You've been reading about walking in the truth, walking with John has been, you know, fond of saying, we're walking in the truth, we're walking in the truth. And you've been telling yourself, but what does that mean? How do I know I'm walking in the truth? How do I know that he is walking in the truth? How do I know that she is walking in the truth? How do I know that some people there, they're religious, they go to church, they go to camp, they go to convention, they go to conference. How do I know that even with all their attendance of religious activity they're not walking in the truth i'll tell you the bible makes it very clear and i want to make it very clear to you so that you will not uh, go away from here confused and say i don't know whether i'm walking in the truth or not you will know i said you will know number one the person who accepts 
abides and acknowledges the truth. He accepts, he abides, he acknowledges the truth that you find in Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 1. Paul is servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God select and the acknowledgement of the truth which is after godliness when the truth comes you don't reject you accept you abide in that truth you acknowledge the truth you you believe the truth as the truth comes to you you don't say i doubt that do i want to take that do i want to believe that do i want to put my whole strength and soul on that the person that hears the truth and believes the truth those are the people walking in the truth the people who don't believe they perish look at second thessalonians chapter 2 second thessalonians chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 12 that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The people who acknowledge the truth, abide in the truth, accept the truth. The people who believe the truth. The people who come to the truth. Come to the truth. You know, sometimes we have a new commerce there. And uh, you've just discovered this is truth about salvation and this is truth about righteous living this is truth about getting to heaven absolute truth without any mixture of error uh -huh, that's good you acknowledge it but now you come to that truth those are the people that are walking in the truth you come to the truth i'm looking at a first timothy chapter 2 First Timothy chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 3 and verse 4. It says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. And tell me what follows. And to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what the Lord wants. That's what he deserves. He wants you to come out of that falsehood. And come out of that error. And come out of that empty religion. And come into the truth. The truth that saves. Now these people who are walking in the truth. They do nothing against the truth. They do nothing against the truth. They will not fight the truth. They will not contradict the truth. They will not trample under their feet the truth. They do nothing against the truth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, we're looking at verse 8. That's what we call it teaching. This is Bible study. It's not just preaching. We're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8. It says in verse um, in chapter 13, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, and then we're reading from verse 8. In verse 8, it says, For this, verse 8. Uh, the reverse I'm looking for, wonderful today. Okay, it said uh, chapter 13, verse 8. Are you there? Yeah. You got there before me. Look at verse 8. But we can tell me, do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. Do nothing against the truth. You come to a church where the truth is preached. You come to a church where the truth is emphasized. You come to the church where the truth is central. Any of our meetings you come to is the truth. The truth of the word of God. And you are supporting that truth. And you are defending that truth. And you are helping with that truth. That's the person walking in the truth. Because you do nothing in your family. You say nothing against the truth. In your private life with your friends, you do nothing against the truth. In your ability, in your activity, in your skill, whatever it is you are doing, you do nothing against the truth. Those are the people who are walking 
in the truth and then the people who are established in the truth established in the truth they're not the people who are being pulled up and then planted and pulled up and being planted in second peter chapter one second peter chapter one i'm reading from verse 12 it says wherefore i will not be negligent to put you i will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things though ye know them and tell me be established in the present truth established in the present truth these are the people that are walking in the truth because if the truth is there you're not established there you know the truth is just lying on the surface of your heart it doesn't go in there and it's not ingrained there it's not planted there it's not effectively walking there and bringing forth fruit there you don't be walking in the truth but when you accept the truth abide in the truth acknowledge the truth when you believe the truth and when you come to the truth say, i've come to the final place i'm here for the truth i'll never go away again when the truth dwells in you and you do nothing against the truth and you're establishing the truth and you are fellow helpers of the truth fellow helpers of the truth you see i'm going to join my ability with this i'm going to join my skill with this as they are preaching the truth i'm going to be a fellow helper of the truth uh, that's what it means as it tells us that we're walking in the truth and i pray that yours will be that experience in jesus name you follow that truth and you fellowship with the people that have that truth and then you are a fellow helper of the truth we're looking at third john verse 8 third john verse 8 it says we therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers of the truth that were fellow helpers of the truth you don't hinder the truth you don't decrease the truth you don't destroy the truth you don't hinder or stop the people that are propagating the truth your fellow helpers of the truth and you are being guided into all truth being guided into all truth the spirit of god comes to you and then that spirit of god is guiding you day by day and you rejoice in that the more truth you hear the more truth you learn the happier you are you are being guided into all truth in john chapter 16 john chapter 16 i'm reading from verse 13 john chapter 16 and we're reading from verse 13 it says how be it when he the spirit of truth is come it will do what it will guide you into all truth it will guide you into all what a joy for us to be saved what a joy for us to be sanctified and what a joy for us to be filled with the holy ghost and day by day as we read the bible i didn't see that before i didn't know that before now i'm getting to know that and the spirit of truth is guiding me guiding you to all the truth and then not only that you hear the truth hear the truth you see you are eager to hear you are eager to hear you are running to the bible study and you are running to the service you say, i hope they have not started i hope they have not started something is trying to delay me i must get there now because you are eager for something you know, wanting to hear the truth in john chapter 18 john chapter 18 i'm reading from verse 37 in John chapter 18, verse 37, and Pilate therefore said unto him, Are thou the king? Then Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end, to this end was I born. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. And everyone, everyone, everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. The person that is walking in the truth is the one that is sold to the truth. 
is committed to the truth he never gives his ear to error but the truth of the word being preached without fear without favor and without mixing any falsehood with that he hears that and he says that's what i delight in and then there's a man that inclines his ears to the truth and he ignores error inclining the ear to the truth and uh, ignoring uh, error it tells us in uh, psalm 78 verse 1 psalm 78 we're reading from verse 1 are you inclined your ear incline your ear to the truth say give ear O my people to my law incline your ears to the words of my mouth that's written before jesus came and it's written that when jesus will come he'll come and declare the truth unto us and then we incline our ears to that truth and when we incline our ears to the truth look at what it does we're looking at uh, proverbs chapter 4 verse 20 proverbs chapter 4 and here we're reading from verse 20 it tells us in proverbs 4 20 it says in chapter 4 verse 20 my son attain to my words incline thine ear unto my says let them not depart from thine from thine eyes keep them in the midst of thine heart for they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh and then we judge by the truth every situation that comes your way you judge that situation by the truth you don't judge by i feel i think they say generally this is what people are saying no you judge by the truth we're looking at psalm 96 in psalm 96 we're reading from verse 13 talking about the character of god which comes to the person that is godly and the person that is given and yielded to the lord psalm 96 verse 13 it says before the lord for he cometh and he for he cometh to judge the earth and shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth with his truth you judge by the truth and of course you keep the truth you keep the truth and you protect the truth and you keep the truth that the truth will not be lost in our church the lord the truth will not be lost in your family the truth will not be lost on our younger generation the truth will not be lost in jesus name isaiah chapter 26 i'm reading from verse 2 isaiah chapter 26 verse 2 open ye the gates that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in the people who enter the kingdom of god eventually are the people that have heard the truth and they keep that truth and of course we we'll love the truth anybody loving the truth there god bless you in jesus name zechariah chapter 8 i'm reading from verse 19 zechariah chapter 8 and we're reading from verse 19 we must love the truth love the truth zechariah chapter 8 verse 19 this is the lord of hosts the last of the, the first of the fourth month and the first of the fifth and the first of the seventh and the first of the tenth shall be to the house of judah joy and gladness i thought somebody would say amen, amen. and cheerful feast therefore 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 because i'm going to bless you therefore love the truth and peace love the truth he wants us to do that to love the truth and then to make that truth known make the truth known don't hide it in your bosom don't hide it on your notes don't hide it in your family don't hide it in the four corners of the church 
publicize it tell other people make it known Isaiah chapter 38 verse 19 make it known Isaiah chapter 38 reading from verse 19 here it says the living the living he shall praise thee as i do this day the father to the children shall make known the truth make known the truth let other people know about the truth of salvation about the truth of eternal life about the truth of escaping hell and the truth of getting to heaven about the truth that jesus and jesus alone can save make sure that the people around you they're not ignorant of the truth you make the truth known that's walking in the truth when you go through all this and you make it practical in your life and you give action action to your knowledge about the truth that is uh, how you will be able to walk consistently and constantly uncompromisingly in the truth and then in daniel chapter 10 verse 21 you note the truth note the truth note the truth take note of the truth the truth that is noted in first peter chapter 1 verse 22 you obey the truth you obey it it's not just that well i've learned it i was at the bible study and i took down some notes are you going to obey that i pray the grace to obey the lord will grant unto every one of us in jesus name in first peter chapter 1 Verse 22. First Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. Purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned, unpretending, transparent love of the brethren. It says, See that she love one another with a pure heart fervently. And then you plead for the truth. Plead for the truth. That's Isaiah chapter 59 verse 4. If you find that, you know, in your local church, the truth has not been preached adequately and fully and consistently and conscientiously, you plead for the truth. You're pleading with God. Oh God, give us a teacher of the word of God that will be so prepared and will be so committed to the truth and he wants us to know the truth and you're pleading with the leadership in the church keep the truth on keep the door open and plead for the truth i've told you that's Isaiah chapter 59 verse 4 and now quit error for the truth you quit error for the truth anyway you see that's falsehood there. That's error there. You quit that place immediately because you'll not have anything to do with error. You quit error for the truth. First Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 to 5. First Timothy chapter 6, write it down, verses 3 to 5. Then you rejoice in the truth. Rejoice in the truth. When the truth comes, and the truth is flowing like a river and the truth is dropping like rain and then you feel the freshness of that truth you rejoice in the truth in first corinthians chapter 13 verse 6 and now you speak the truth you speak the truth anything that is different from the truth that is colored that is adjusted that is modified, uh uh, that's not your way. Because you're walking in the truth, and walking in the truth demands that you will speak the truth. In fact, uh, I'm going to read this one in Psalm 15. Psalm 15, uh, I'm reading from verse 1. Psalm 15, verse 1, it says in Psalm 15, verse 1, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly. That's me. I said that's me. It will happen to you in Jesus' name. He that walketh uprightly and walketh righteousness. Tell me the rest. And speaketh the truth in his heart. Speaketh the truth in his heart. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Teach the truth. 
testify the truth. It says, the people that came from you, they testified of the truth that's in you. That's a third John chapter 1 verse 3. And then understand the truth. Understand the truth. If you're here and you don't understand, the devil will come and snatch everything away. And so you have a duty and you keep on reading. Read it over again. Read it over again. Go back to that note again. Get to that outline again. Get to that tape again. Listen and listen until you understand the truth. You understand to the point it drives you to action. I must repent. It drives you to action. I must pray. It drives you to action. I must reconcile. It drives you to action. I must make restitution. It drives you to action. I must take care of my family you hear the truth and you understand the truth Daniel I'm reading from chapter 9 Daniel chapter 9 and we're looking at verse 13 Daniel chapter 9 we're reading from verse 13 understanding the truth here it tells us in Daniel chapter 9 verse 13 as it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil is come upon us, yet we make we, yet made we not our prayer, our supplication before the Lord, our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and tell me the rest and understand the truth understand the truth he wants us to understand and he wants us to be valiant for the truth valiant for the truth courageous for the truth that here is truth and then there are people that are kind of they're timid they don't have any backbone and the truth is they're almost lying on the ground and people are going to step on that here you come because Truth is your soul, it's your heart, it's your life. Truth is your lifeblood. And you come up and you pick up that truth. You are valiant for the truth and you declare that truth everywhere. That's what the Lord is looking for. He's looking for the people that are valiant for the truth. Jeremiah, you know, Jeremiah was going around and then the Lord is saying, He's looking for people, people that will be valiant for the truth. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 9. In Jeremiah chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 3. Jeremiah chapter 9, and we're reading from verse 3. Here it says in verse 3, they bend their tongues like the bone, like for lies. But they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth. They are not valiant for the truth upon the earth. But that's what the Lord wants us to do. He wants us to so cherish the truth. And he wants us to accept the truth. He wants us to defend the truth. He wants us to be valiant for the truth. He wants us to worship God in spirit and in truth. No error, no false doctrine, no pretense, no hypocrisy. He wants us to worship God. God in spirit and in truth. That's John chapter 4 verses 23 and 24. He wants us to experience the truth in its entirety. He wants us to experience the truth in its entirety. That is, everything we're hearing to go on your knees and to say, this truth I have heard will be translated and transplanted into my heart, into my life. That's walking in the truth because it is the truth that is transplanted in your heart, the truth that's embedded in your heart, the truth that is hidden in your heart, that will be walking from the basis, from the ground of your heart. It will control your life, experiencing the truth in its entirety. And that's what the Lord is telling us in First Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse uh, 13. First Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verse 13. It says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word, the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth. 
the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. It will work in your heart. And then you are so committed to that truth, you do it. Whether the teacher is there or not, whether the people who taught us, whether they are there or not, you are so yielded to that truth and say, I'm going to live by the truth. You will. I said you will. And this word will have impact in your life so much that the people that see you, the people that know you, they will say that man has been taught the word and is living by the word. And this word will never be ineffectual in your life in Jesus' name. And look at Philemon here. Philemon is telling us something about Philemon. And he's telling us what he expects that you will do. And that is how you are going to live according According to the word of God. Look at uh, verse 21 of Philemon. Has only one chapter. Having confidence in thy obedience. Your obedient people. Are you still there? Yeah. Or are they? I said your obedient people. Yeah. You obey the word of God in Jesus name. Yeah. Having confidence in your obedience. I wrote unto thee. Knowing that. I'm sure of this. I'm sure about you. I said, I'm sure about you. Knowing that thou wilt also do, thou will also do, thou will also do more than I say. Those are the people that experience the word. The word is translated into them and they experience that they are yoked to the truth. They are yoked to the truth. They are yoked to Jesus Christ, who is the truth. And because they are yoked to the truth, only where the truth will enter, that's where they will enter. Only where the truth will go, that's where they will go. That's where they will go. Only what the truth will allow them to do, that's what they will do. And they sever every connection, every relationship with falsehood and error. And now they are zealous for the truth. Zealous for the truth. That's why we're always running to the Bible study. That's why we're always eager to do what the Lord has commanded us to do. Because we love the truth and the truth alone. Because we appreciate the truth and the truth alone. Because we're living by the truth and the truth alone. Because we're going to live and die by the truth and for the truth. And the truth alone. And nothing outside the truth. Nothing different from the truth. Nothing contrary to the truth and nothing opposed to the truth will ever find any place in our hearts in jesus name nothing outside the truth contrary to the truth and nothing erroneous will find a place in your heart in jesus name in psalm 119 psalm 119 i'm reading from verse 1 Three nine, Psalm one nineteen, Psalm uh, verse one three nine. It says, "My zeal has consumed me, because mine enemies have forgotten thy words." One forty, thy word is very pure; therefore, thy servant loveth it. And then in verse one forty two, one forty two, it says, "Thy righteousness is an." everlasting righteousness and thy law is tell me the truth it said because of that i'm zealous for that that's what the lord is calling you to that's what the lord is calling me to and he's telling us that we must walk by the truth accept the truth abide in the truth acknowledge the truth believe the truth come to the truth and be committed to the truth and choose the way of truth and dwell in the truth and do nothing against the truth be established in the truth be, fe be fellow helpers of the truth and be guided into all truth and then hear the truth incline your ear unto the truth and ignore error completely judge by the truth 
keep the truth love the truth make known the truth and note the truth obey the truth and plead for the truth every time everywhere and quit error for the truth rejoice always in the truth and speak the truth and seek the truth and tell the truth teach the truth and testify of the truth understand the truth be valiant for the truth worship god in spirit and in truth experience the truth in its entirety be yoked to the truth and sever every relationship with anything of error and be zealous for the truth as much as the false prophets are zealous for falsehood and error you stand up and say those false people will not be more zealous than i am they are zealous for error they are zealous for the for falsehood i'm going to rise up and from tonight i'll be zealous for the truth of the revelation of the word of god and the grace of god will be multiplied in your life it says my grace is sufficient for you as you leave this place and then you pray in the word of god you go and you walk by the truth lord i will lord i will lord i will he will help you let's rise up and talk to the lord in prayer and tell the lord everything you've learned today you are going to practice this word you are going to lay by the truth of the word of god and this truth will never be diminished in your life and you're telling the Lord today, O oh Lord, plant this truth in my heart that I may walk in the truth.